creative, very talented gentleman on the phone with us right now, Alan Carter of Carter Comics. How you doing today, Alan? I'm doing great, Keith. How about yourself? Hey, I'm I'm doing fine as a matter of fact, man. Just, you know, working hard, making it happen. So everything's lovely. All right. All right. Um now okay, now, now I I'll jump right into it now, okay? When did you first decide that you wanted to create your own comics books? Or 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 better yet, I should say, not that when did you decide you wanted to create your own comics, but where did you start? Just the inspiration. Did, did it come from drawing or, or different stories or Well, that came from uh, two areas in my life when I was little. It was a lot of Saturday morning cartoons. A lot of the superhero cartoons are available in the late 80s. So a lot of Spider-Man, X-Men, a lot of half of stuff like Super Friends. That got me into it. And then also just a lot of things that would happen in my life. And I actually started writing stories about things that would happen if I went out with my parents just to the store if something weird happened. And I just loved telling stories. So it was a combination of the stories I was already telling and then really getting into superheroes and I thought when I was about third grade I just said said to myself, you know, why don't I just do my own superhero stories and just see how that turns out? And the more I did it, the more I just really enjoyed it. It was just something that I kept on improving and adding characters and adding different stories. So I mean it started at six and it really started to get to find that eight years old. So it was a really early time where I really decided that I wanted to do uh, comics and then create my own stories and illustrate. Okay. Now, so so like you say, you could you could be out and, and you know, out with your parents in, in a, a different story. Now, first of all, you were from Hawaii. Oh, yes. How, how was life in Hawaii? Like, what's, you know, because you're, you're where are you at? Are you in, um, are you in this California now or? Oh yes, yeah, I'm in uh, North Hollywood, California. Okay. Now, what what's you know, there has to be some sort of a difference. Like, what was life in you know the difference in life in Hawaii opposed to California? Now, like, is is there a difference? Or between the pace, it's uh, it's much faster between California and Hawaii. Hawaii is uh, much more laid back than California. Mm -hmm. uh, the weather, I actually do like the weather better in California just because I, I got kind of tired of humidity. So I, I kind of like dry heat better and it, it gets colder here and I like the cold. Oh, <laughs> so okay. that, that's the advantage for, for California to Hawaii. I, I, I do miss the, uh, there is a big family atmosphere in Hawaii that I do miss. Even if, you know, with your neighbors, mm -hmm. any, anybody you meet, uh, you become family. Uh, they actually have a, they, or Ohana which is the Hawaiian word for family there. So there's a lot of, a lot of family, family dynamic there in Hawaii. And okay. the main things are just the weather and okay. uh, the lifestyle. Also insects too. Uh, oh. Much more insects in Hawaii. <laughs> oh, really? I guess because of the climate, I suppose. Like it's, it's probably perfect for them. Definitely less smog for, for, for them, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, um... Uh, but that's that's still got to be pretty cool though. Like just you know, even growing. Up. Have you ever thought about, uh, you know, and, and have you ever thought about writing or, or creating, um, you know, comic stories that that had anything to do with Hawaii in them, or, or maybe Hawaii based, or maybe one of your characters would be from Hawaii? Is that ever crossed your mind? When I started out, a lot of my uh, comics were actually later on they became Hawaii based. I didn't. I never did a story that was completely based in Hawaii. I kind of used it as a backdrop because that's you know because I was born and raised there. That's what I knew. So okay. I decided why don't I put all of my characters in Hawaii just so it's easier for me to do backgrounds and surroundings. It's easier for me to come up with stories. And you know, growing up there, I can show up to my friends. They can identify with them. They can say, "Oh yeah, I know where that place is and where that place is." So I've done backdrops. With a lot of my, a lot of the comics I'm doing now, Hawaii is a backdrop, and but to this point, I don't have a story that's completely completely based in Hawaii, which I really like to do. Just something where it's the character is really talking, really uh, you're experiencing what they're going through in Hawaii. So that's actually something I like to do. Just maybe delve into deeper 
Yeah, I, you know, th th I guess that was kind of what drew me to ask that because it just it seems like that might that that, that might have a, a kind of cool setting to it. Or it might be something different and unique about it. Um, where, you know, when you come up with your stories, like what 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 is pretty much the tools that you yourself um the tools that you self find, you know, find necessary. I mean, obviously, you know, and, and and when I ask that question, I mean, pretty much the breakdown. I mean, you know, do you come up with the story and then you've got to get your pencil ready? You know, is it a pencil for you? Is, is it the pen for you and the paper? Like, what do you use to bring these stories to life? Well, it starts, it all starts with a general idea. Mm -hmm. Which goes down, and a lot of times the general idea of what the story is going to be uh, starts with the script. And once I'm done with the script, I'll go straight to the storyboard. So it'll be pencil storyboards, mm -hmm. uh, inks, then I'll take it into Photoshop for coloring. And with the storyboards, what I do is that between script and storyboard, that's actually the most fascinating and can also be a very difficult process because you have to transfer everything that you wrote into words. And a lot of times when you write something, it sounds really good as writing, and then when you try to transfer it to paper to draw, you think, okay, that, that's a really good scene. How am I going to translate that? So sometimes you have to make some changes. So I've actually mapped out page numbers on scripts, right. uh, meaning page numbers on that's going to be in the actual comic, so I can see all this dialogue is going to be on page one, all this dialogue is going to be on page two. I have you know, this many panels. So once that's done, I can go straight into a comic board instead of doing thumbnails because I'm not sure what I, you know, what I want to have in the final product. I started doing that in my last comic and that made things faster and actually easier to, to follow. So mm -hmm. it's all scripts, storyboard, pencil, ink, color on Photoshop, and then it's oh. taken to be printed and it becomes a comic book. Okay, okay. Now, is it, Diff I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, you know, it's probably a bit easy to you because you're professional, you know what you're doing. But to write a script, you know, I, and I guess, you know, to everybody out there listening, when you think of write, when people hear the term or the words write a script, they're thinking a lot of words. Right. How do you manage to take so many words, like you say, and and just take them in, and just turn them into a picture? Because it's hard for most people who don't know how to do it to be able to to take words and just make a picture and it describes it all. Like how how do you pull that off? Like well, I always have the idea in my head. So even when I'm writing uh, a scene or a dialogue and a script, I'm already kind of picturing a general idea of what it's going to be like. Okay. And then when I'm done, because it always starts with like this kind of abstract idea, it's like a general idea, and then the more I do it, the more detail I get, so I know exactly what's going to be in the scene. So if I have just a talking scene that's about two pages, I know that that's what I want, and then when I type it and I type the dialogue, then I can, I can you know, think a little like beats in my head. Uh, beats that are going to be in the panel saying, okay, this guy's going to talk. And then he's going to talk for two panels, and that guy's going to talk back. And then oh. the best thing I actually did was to write as much as I could, mm -hmm. and then once I did the actual panels, I can kind of simplify that and say, okay, I have, no, I have what I want, but I don't need that many words. So I can just pretty much reduce the amount of words and make the, the actual story, the actual scene flow a little faster. Oh, okay, okay. Because so, in other words, I guess no joke. Like, you pretty much are writing scripts, and you're literally like you're you're pretty much drawing your movie, right? Oh, exactly. <laughs> right. That's that's why I said like that's 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 like pretty for real to to you know be actually doing this to take serious. Like you know it's not you know it's not to some people it's not as simple um, as just hey you know. I got an you know an idea of a character and I'm just gonna draw him. I mean, some people just doodle and and you know fine for that, but you know like you're actually putting this stuff on paper and you'll really have it already written out. Like he's gonna do this and he's gonna do that, and that's what made me ask that question. Like, you know, what is the format behind it? Um, now, how do you decide? Uh, are all your stories 
um, geared towards comedy? Um, do you have your serious issues? Are they, are they, do you do both or? I, I do both, and I do that for for me and for any customers at conventions, any fans, because for me, it keeps me from getting burned out because I can switch between different projects. And then for the fans, they can kind of pick and choose what they want. So if they want a uh, classic comic strip, I have that. If they want uh, satire, they can get that. So two different types of comedy. And then if you want something really serious, then I'll, you know, I have a graphic novel series for that. So mm. I have probably just one serious comic book and then two different types of comedy just to, to spice it up, just so that there's a little bit of every everything for everybody. Okay, right. That's what I was going to say. But there is something out there for for the different reader. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, are there ever any ways to to include emotional subjects inside of of these comic books? Because I guess I'll ask this question first. When a lot of people hear the term comic book, okay. It is it does that go a lot deeper than some people think? Because a lot of people out here, when they think of comic books nowadays, they're just thinking comedy. So I'll ask that question. Is comic related to comedy or is that just total difference? Um, it's a little different, but I have to say that comic books are that's the reason I asked that question was um you know because with you know with somebody like yourself your work um which take the mongoose we get we'll get into later but you know just with you know I noticed you 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 your post and you have people like you did the other day and you have people actually try to figure out what's going on in the scene and so that's why I really brought that I kind of wanted to bring that to light to give the listeners out there an opportunity to understand it they're it's like you said, it's not like back years ago when, you know, when people hear the term comic, the first thing they're just thinking is, hey, you know, this is just a, a good funny joke or this is, you know, there are some, you know, they're, 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 they're thinking aspects to it. You've got to use your mind. They, you know, nowadays, as you say, these comics have re- have evolved to the point that, listen, intelligence is necessary. So, you know, not to be taken lightly that there are serious issues. Um, there, there are learning aspects to this. Um and, and they metaphorically speak as well nowadays, right? Oh, exactly. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Um, now, okay. What were some of what were some of your biggest influences? Oh, okay, because I know. Look, I, I know, like you say, you be you know you be out somewhere, and these ideas will come to you, and you start wanting to draw and come up with scripts. But before that, who were some of your favorites? Like, you know, like you say, who who were your favorites that you like? Was it Flash, as you say, or? Wow, my, I remember my first, I had so many uh, firsts. I, I can think of, like, of two, actually. Uh-huh. My first cartoon that I really got into was Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. Okay. And that actually was replay, because that came on, I think, in the early 80s, and I kind of missed it, because I was born in 1980 so I didn't catch it until later on in the era when I was about 7 and 8 and I really got into that and I loved that's why I loved doing uh, I loved teen superhero shows because the more the merit is like what's better than one superhero have three have four have five that's even better because you have all these different powers and you can see all these you know different visuals and it was just so amazing for me and that I saw that and I was like oh I want to do something like that I can't do maybe a cartoon but I like to just tell my own story with my own team 
Mm-hmm. And then the other thing was in the comic version, the first comic I saw was a Flash comic that my dad had. Okay. And it was the cover of it that really intrigued me. It was the way that they actually captured the Flash's super speed while just standing still and just the still photo. Right. And it was just, I was just, I, didn't, I don't even think I read the full comic. I may have just stared at the cover <laughs> about five minutes. I was just so mesmerized by it. I think I was about eight or nine years old. <laughs> right. Now, that, that takes me to um, Cosmic Force. Okay. Um, um, one of your books, as a matter of fact, it, explain that a little bit, your concept behind Cosmic Force, and, and who are they? Oh, Cosmic Force. Um, that was, that was specifically based off my love of science fiction and paranormal, paranormal shows. I was a big fan of the show Unsolved Mysteries. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I love that show, and especially, I think the first time I watched it, they did a show on UFO sightings, and I was mes- that was another one where I was just mesmerized by it. I was there are just some things where I see them the first time and they'll stick with me forever. And I and for years I was just so intrigued by that. And I had already done a team of superheroes that was an early version of Cosmic Force, and it was when I was younger it was more about what they could do and the powers. And as I got older, I developed the personalities. So. Cosmic Force is one of those stories that started from age 8 up to, say, age 17, because by that point, I developed the story. So it morphed from just a team of superheroes just in a town to later on, putting in my love of UFOs into that story and saying, this is a story that's going to be like an episode of Unsolved Mysteries, like somebody gets abducted or you know somebody encounters an alien. And... Later, the story just became five people meet in the field for a meteor shower, and as we watch the meteor shower, they just see these objects, these circular objects come toward them, and they start to just charge them like heat-seeking missiles. And they're frightened. They don't know what to do. They just know they have to get away. They don't. They get struck down, and it appears that they're dead. But the next day, they, they, they wake up, they're across town, not on the field anymore, don't know how they got there. They each discover they have their own power that's triggered by a personality trait, say a daydreamer or someone who has a short temper, that triggers their ability. And it's one thing after another. Once they realize they have these abilities and they think, okay, we need to get these under control, get back to society, mm-hmm. then they realize, they look at a newspaper and they say, wait a second, it's been, it hasn't been 24 hours, it's been two years since it's happened. And everyone thinks that we've been dead this long. How do we get back to our old lives? I mean, are we just stuck? And these are people who met each other that night. They got to get to know each other because they they have to find a way to get back to society. And each time, again, each time they try to get close, something else happens. The third thing that happens is they figure out they're being stalked by government agents because they think they're aliens invading. So they have to take all this in and just say, okay, we need to find a way to get back. We've got people on our tails. What do we do now? And, and it's actually because it's three adults and two kids. The kids have to pretty much make the decision to say, well, the kids are just like, hey, look, we need to just try to use these powers to get back. We might have to, if we're cornered, we might have to, you know, master these powers to get back to society. We may have to play the role of hero, which they end up doing to survive and then people see them as the superhero team. They're these unlikely heroes. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, people are, you know, it's split. Some people like them, some people think they're here to destroy them because they think they're aliens. Plus you have the friends and family of the these five people who don't know how to cope with their debts, don't realize that they're still alive. And it comes to a head after the big fight, after, you know, the fourth issue I did where everyone finds out what's going on one of the reporters who's a friend of one of the characters mm-hmm. finds out, you know, try, you know, starts to figure out something's not right and she later figures out who they are and tries to help them get back to society. And there are so many other things that lead from there because then you have, you're trying to figure out what happened to them. And if this is, you know, the result from, of extraterrestrials doing this, are they going to land? Uh, if, are these people going to stay together? 
Mm-hmm. You know, um, some of them are going to split up because they don't want to be together. They don't want to. They want to be with their family because they realize that you know the family doesn't miss them because they've had some family problems. So there are so many different directions that you can take it after you establish who they are because there's. You know, it's a bunch of people on the run, and finally they have to be grounded somehow, and then slowly but surely get accepted. But even that, you know, you, you're going to have some rocky points. So there's so many different directions you can take something. Yeah, and uh, a story like that. I'm, I, you know what? I'm just sitting here and I'm listening to all this, and I really got lost in this story. And, and I'll tell you what: uh, the the reason I got lost into it is because Alan. It, 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 the whole time you're telling me this, I'm hearing like a series, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is something that, like, I'm amazed, you know, again, um, congratulations, because this this sounds like a TV series. I know that's not, you know, really what you do, but um, that's amazing to, to come up with such a plot like that. I mean, that's like what? Like, what is that, a season <laughs> right there? Like, um, that's... Yeah, I mean, those first issues, I mean, I did... Uh I did five issues of four of the five are an origin chapter, which I'm going to later do as a, a trade paperback. And that chapter could be part one of a film. That's what I'm talking about. Like I'm sitting here and I'm like, wait a minute now. Like this is, this is serious. You know what I mean? Um, that's amazing. And, and this particular one, you started working, you started working on this and you said eight years old. It wasn't the exact, story but a lot of the there's a yeah. few of the characters were actually created when i was eight they were it was, it was a weird transition because i had two characters that are later in this book and they, they actually started out as um these half human half uh, eagle characters it was uh there was one of the first things i learned to draw so they kind of started out that way and it was yeah. pretty much the same type of name but i kept talking them until i found i kind of found something that i wanted it was because Gotham Force was one of those stories where I had kind of an idea because it was something that I liked. Mm-hmm. So it was something influenced by what I saw on TV, what I saw in other comic books. And then it evolved into something that had a lot of my interest in it, as mm-hmm. opposed to a lot of some of the other books I do where it's this idea that it's when you say, that's a great idea, I'm going to do a book about it. This was like this long process. Right. Now let's um okay, let's let's talk about damn tourists. We're we're going to figure speech um, speech mongers, but let's talk about damn tourists for a second. Like what, what what is the plot behind that? I love that title. Oh well, it's this. It's basically these four tourists who are recently retired. They got plenty of time on their hands, so. They're travel. They're basically traveling the entire world, and they have all these bad habits that people characterize tourists with. Because when you, when you think of the name tourist, you're already you're already thinking of something almost you know not really derogatory, but just something just something laughable. Because you know there's kind of visitor people like the term visitor when they think of tourists, they just think of somebody who's in this loud aloha shirt and. He's got a camera on the neck and yeah. they're walking around kind of lost. They got a map. And, you know, when you think of the name tourist, you'll think of someone who has all these, you know, habits. Like they mispronounce things and uh, they don't watch where they're going. And, of course, they're wearing, you know, tacky attire. They're taking photos of everything. And I thought, right. those those characteristics, those things that, you know, I grew up in Hawaii, so I saw that almost every single day. Of no course. one needs to be represented as powers. Mm-hmm. It's a cool thing to just say, you know what? These habits that they have are so bad that they're actually, they're actually superhuman powers. But they don't realize their powers. They just, that's just what they do every day. So they don't realize that. Even the people who they unintentionally do this to, other tourists and visitors, they don't view them as powers. They're just still annoying. So that's part of the, the comedy in it. So you have uh, four characters. You got Mr. Invincible, you got Miss Informed, you got Mr. Postcard, and you have Mr. Aloha. And they each have their own bad uh, vacation habits. So you got Mr. Invincible, who's got tunnel vision, and he's invincible because 
because he's not paying attention to where he's going, he, you know, he'll run into things, he'll knock people over, he'll run people over, and doesn't realize it because he's looking at a map, looking at something else, and like, yeah, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna see, you know, this statue, I'm gonna go to this store, I'm gonna go to this scenic point, I'm gonna go to this beach, and he's just knocking people over on foot, just trying to get to it, and he, he won't even look to see if he knocks somebody down. He's just, he just keeps going. He's, he's just that. moving, right? <laughs> yeah. It's all about the vacation. Right. And but now these sorry, and they have powers though, you say. And the thing is that they're the the catch is that the vacation habits are so bad they're superhuman, so they've been exaggerated to, to being superhuman powers. Oh. Okay. So when they're done in the book they're kind of they look like that. So for uh, Mr. Invincible I'll have him like in this, this kind of like blue aura when he's driving and you see him knocking people over and he's got this eternal smile on his face. All of them do because they're just happy to be on vacation. <laughs> nothing's going to phase them. Nothing's going to get them upset because they're having fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're not inconveniencing anybody. I mean, they're, if they're never inconvenienced and if they are, it ends up inconveniencing somebody else. So, okay. <laughs> they always have a good time. <laughs> right. Now, what about, um, okay. Figure of Speech Mongoose. Did I get the title right on that? Oh, yes. The Figure of Speech Mongoose. Oh, yeah. That's my boy right there. Now, what's going on with the Mongoose? Uh, well, before I tell that, I, uh, cause just, shoot, just using a Mongoose for the concept, uh, there's a little story behind that. Uh -huh. Because the Mongoose, while it was, you know, it's not native to Hawaii, but it was imported in the, in the 1800s to control the rat population. Oh. The problem was that because the rats were eating native bird eggs, so they're trying to get the mongoose to kill the rats. But the mongoose came out during the day, rats came out at night. So they, the mongoose could never kill the rat because they were out at different times. And then the mongoose needed something to eat, so the mongoose, along with the rat, ate bird eggs, among other things. So it became an even bigger pest. Now, they're still hard to find there, but, you know, they're still around. And I just thought it was such an intriguing character, because I was a big fan of uh, Ricky Tiki Tavi in school. I, I uh, liked that cartoon. And it was the only time I'd seen a mongoose drawn as a cartoon. Mm -hmm. And I thought it looked okay, but I just thought it kind of looked too much like a squirrel to me, just because I saw what a mongoose looked like. And... I just thought, you know, I'd like to do some. I'd like to do something with a mongoose. And originally, he was supposed to be a mascot for the local bus company, mm -hmm. but that didn't work out too well. So I just said, well, let me just hold on to him. I have a. I can probably come up with an idea for him, but I want to. This is a great concept. It's a great character. So I want to find something for him, even if it takes several years. Mm -hmm. And about two years ago, I did this flash cartoon about a mongoose that misses the bus and he was actually catching the bus using a fishing line and it took a few months and I just thought well I've had this mongoose character for a while I'm not sure what I want to do with him I went back to the flash cartoon and I said well wait a second catching the bus is an expression it's a figure of speech why don't I try to see how many figures of speech I can do and see where I can take it mm -hmm. so I thought that might work. I mean, I can come up with some. And I thought, well, I need a name for him. And I thought, I, I wanted something really quick, probably like a Mr. Mongoose or something like that. And I just thought, well, this is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be silly. His name should be silly. So why don't I just call him what he is, the figure of speech Mongoose. Right. And that was it. <laughs> now, what, what, now, what is, what, okay, now he's, ca he's catching a bus with a fishing line now. Is he, what, was he, was he like was he throwing the fishing line out there and just kind of going on with it like or was he pulling the bus back how give me a visual on that what he did was that he's walking up to the bus stop he already misses the bus <laughs> he's sitting down there figuring what to do and then he's like wait i got an idea mm -hmm. and just in crazy comic strip cartoon fashion he pulls a fishing line out of his front pocket to, to hook the bus back just because he happens to have it. <laughs> right. You know, I, 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 people out there going to think I'm like odd for saying this, but you know what? If people could actually do that in real life, you know how much, how many people that missed a bus? Because missing a bus is a big deal. 
So, you know, I got, I got to commend the mongoose for coming up with actually a pretty good idea. Nobody can figure out how to catch a bus once it's already gone by, right? So, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, look, when, okay, um, you know, you just had a convention um, go on. I know we got like five minutes left, but you just had a convention um, the other day. How was that for you? Uh, it, was, it was such a great show. Uh, it's a show I've been doing. I did it twice previously this year, March and June, and now just this past November 16th, the San Fernando Valley Comic Convention in Granada Hills, which is about 40 to 45 minutes from where I am, so it's not too bad. It's so local for me. It's a really nice, small show, a really devoted crowd, and this was really... It was one of the better shows I've done with them. It also a show that really showed me what people like because I do th because I do three different books. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's difficult to, to to try to figure out what people like. And for this one, there, everyone who came by my table was talking about the figure speech mongoose, and I had him. And he was I had you know three books on there, and he was kind of toward the corner, so I was wondering what people look at, and they just were gravitated to that. And uh, one person bought three issues that I have out. Second person bought another three issues that were out. Other people that came by went to sample it. They looked at the figure speech bongos first and said, oh, wow, you know, how did you come up with this idea? And, you know, this is really cute and this is really mm -hmm. uh, clever. And, you know, what does he do? And I was, and I was just not really shocked, but I, I mean, I was glad that, that <laughs> they really enjoyed it just because there were so many other books. I mean, you had Dan Church next to it and, Right. That used to be the book that, that drew people in. So right. it was one of those things where it was almost a late reaction because when I did I thought, oh, people are going to really like this. And sometimes you can never tell what people are into, which is kind of why I do three books because I can kind of decide. I can say, okay, you got A, B, C, and then people are like, oh, okay, I like C. And then another person's I like A. So I'm like, oh, well, I've got all three, so you can take your pick. But for somebody to just narrow in on that and say, I like this, this mongoose character, I want more of him, I thought, oh, okay, cool. Because then you kind of decide that makes you figure out what you want in the forefront. Mm -hmm. So that sure really helped me decide, okay, I want the figure speech mongoose to kind of take the lead in the, the three books as a way to introduce people into my world of comics to say, you're going to start with the figure speech mongoose because he's, you know, he's one character. Uh, he can kind of do whatever he wants because you know, he basically just does figure speech. He does, you know, illustrates a lot of things. He's got this cute, cool look. He's really accessible. So uh, I really like that show because that that show helped me decide what character I want right. to be front and center. Right. Now, well, um, you know, uh, real quick, how, because I want to ask you this question and then I, I want you to, I uh, had time to let everybody know where they can go Um check out your books or when your next convention is coming up. What about family life for you? Um, any kids, the the wife, or, or what about family life? Uh, well, right now the family life is uh, a single life for me. I, um, I, spend my I spend so much time on my books. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, like, only now, even the last few years, I've been dividing my time between books uh, hanging out with friends, staying with family. I got some family here. Right. Uh, my mother's here. Uh, my sister's here. I have a cousin here. Um, uh, I have an uncle here. So I've got more and more family here. So that's that's still my family life. And then I have a lot of my friends I hang out with. Okay. And then along with that, I have my comics, which I always like to call because this is, this is completely true. Because my comics, in a way, are my kids right now because right. you know I created them and I you know added you know creative personalities and stories about them and you know taken parts of my personality or in my characters so right. at, at least for right now uh, it's, it's all about of course the figure speech mongoose and damn tourists are my kids <laughs> all right now let everybody know because we've got about a minute left let everyone know where they can go check out your work at well, you can check out my work at my website. That's uh, brand making new website too. It's called it's Alan Carter Squarespace .com. So that's Alan A L L E N hyphen Carter C A R T E R 
www.squarespace.com and I've got my three series on there. I have a shop, online shop on my website so you can purchase the books. You can do a download of, of any of the books you want, Figure Speech Mongoose, Cosmic Force, or Damn Tourist. I do a weekly blog. Uh, every Sunday I'll do a blog. I'll blog about uh, Marvel films or my co uh, comic conventions, mm -hmm. anything comic cartoon related I'll talk about. Um, and I also have uh, prints that I sell on there. So I have uh, prints featuring the Damn Tourist characters and the Figure Speech Mongoose characters. And they all, you know, they have prints, the Damn Tourist characters have prints of different places they've, they've gone to. I have a print on Niagara Falls where uh, they're, they're creating havoc there. I have a uh, print of the Mongoose where he's uh, illustrating a figure speech of uh, on a roll on an actual uh, dinner roll. So I have all that for sale on alancarter.squarespace.com and also have a Twitter page and Twitter is at cartercomics1. Okay. All right. Sounds great. Um, Listen, as a matter of fact, um, it's time for us to get out of here. Alan, uh, I'm going to ask you to come back. Look, after we are done this, I want you to let me know. Um, We'll talk again and see if you can come back in here next week, man. If you can come back on next week, if you find if you can find some time, because I, I really want to talk. Oh, more. Definitely. Yeah, I, I really want to talk more about these characters and what's going on on in the book. Um, so I'd like to invite you on next week and we'll let everybody know when it's going down and, and come on back. I've got a date in mind already. We'll wait till we let everybody know. But come on back next week again and talk to us, Alan. Oh, definitely. I'll be back next week because I got another convention I want to uh, tell everybody else. That's what everybody I'm, about next week, next week Friday. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, um, and also for everybody out there, um, that you know didn't get to to um, you know maybe missed a few things or had some more questions, make sure that they know that they can go onto the website, um, social, you know, Facebook, the YouTube page, and different places like that, and you can catch the interview today with myself and Alan Carter. Alan, it's been a pleasure. Um,